This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com slash the dig and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Axis Pipeline, and the Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance by Nick Estes. In 2016, a small protest encampment at the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota, initially established to block construction of the Dakota Access oil pipeline, grew to be the largest indigenous protest movement in the 21st century. Water protectors knew this battle for native sovereignty had already been fought many times before, and that, even after the encampment was gone, their anti-colonial struggle would continue. In Our History is the Future, Nick Estes traces traditions of indigenous resistance that led to the no-DAPL movement. Our History is the Future is at once a work of history, a manifesto, and an intergenerational story of resistance. I recently did a really incredible, in-depth, lengthy interview with Nick as well. You can find it at thedigradio.com. You should also really buy and read the book. Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline, and the Long History of Indigenous Resistance by Nick Estes. Out now from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. Our world is too often described by words that function to protect the status quo. Accountability is demanded of teachers, as though the problems with underfunded and segregated schools originate within those schools' walls. The market is not made but rather a force of nature inscribed with human attributes. Markets have sentiments and can be optimistic or skittish. The cult of wellness instructs us to maximize our own health and virtue through personal discipline and sophisticated consumption. Poor people must develop grit and then be celebrated for their resilience while receiving the hard blows from a world that cannot be changed. Our bosses are not bosses or capitalists or even managers, but rather disruptors and entrepreneurs who don't exploit labor, but rather innovate. Ordinary language is the sound of hegemony. It is also an archive of the struggles to overturn it. Language is an institution and a constantly emergent field of struggle. It is the product of power relations, and it is also itself power relations. This is what I'm discussing today with John Patrick Leary, the author of Keywords, The New Language of Capitalism. Before we get going, I'm going to make this request for your support at patreon.com slash the dig, a quick one. This podcast, as is already probably clear to you, is above all else about a political mission. And so we are dedicated to providing every episode for free with no paywall so that the maximum number of people can hear each interview. We can do that because those of you who can afford to support the podcast do so at patreon.com slash the dig. Even a few bucks a month is a big help. If you donate $10 or more, we also have left-wing books to send you in the mail as a token of our gratitude. So if you love this podcast and think we are doing something unusual and important, contribute now at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. <laughs> 
One other thing I have recently neglected to mention at the end of recent episodes that Jen Kinney did the entirety of the production work on last week's episode and a bunch of it on the prior week's because Alex Lewis, our producer, is on vacation. Jen, thank you. You're doing an excellent job. Okay, here's John Patrick Leary, a professor of English at Swarthmore College and the author of Keywords, The New Language of Capitalism, out now from Haymarket Books. He's also the author of A Cultural History of Underdevelopment, Latin America in the U.S. Imagination, and a columnist for the New Republic, writing on the politics of language and the language of politics. John Patrick Leary, welcome to The Dig. Thank you for inviting me. Thought leaders inspire within us the passion that we need to understand that the business ecosystem can create social innovations through engaging stakeholders to curate a flexible approach that will prove resilient in the face of market headwinds. I, I just made up that sentence as from as sort of a Frankenstein's monster of the vocabulary <laughs> you skewer in your book. It, it sounds utterly vacuous, which, which it is on some level, but it's not meaningless. What does today's language of business not only convey, but more importantly, do? Yeah, what it, what it conveys is at some level, uh, and it incorporates a critique of business and working life that has been percolating in American culture in particular, but I think across you know, the English-speaking world in general since roughly the New Deal and especially since the 60s and 70s. So the, the, the kind of rhetoric of uh, nature that you kind of allude to with market headwinds, in which I talk about in the book in terms of ecosystems and sustainability, uh, is one way of imbuing business and working life with a sense not only of the naturalness of buying and selling of profit and of capital, but also incorporating some sense of the critique that others have made of the destruction of the natural environment by our forms of uh, production. So the one of the things that one of the most important things that this kind of language of capitalism today does, and one of the things that I think distinguishes it, is the way it has drawn on incorporated all sorts of critiques of uh, of, of working life, whether it's the critique of the drudgery and bureaucracy of the office with celebrations of the creative class or the drudgery of factory labor with the um, valorization of the knowledge economy. Your your book was a real revelation for me because it really demystified and denaturalized this entire vocabulary that has become so normal and that seems so normal. Yet in reality, what your etymologies show is that they're often very new. But, but before we get into a lot of details about your glossary of neoliberalism ease, I want to cover some basic Marxist theory of language. How, how do you see language as simultaneously shaping the world and reflecting it? Well, I, I, first of all, just the, the, the easy, simple answer to that is because it's dialectical like everything else. <laughs> Correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it, um, so it, it, it's, it's a product of social relations and uh, but it also determines them. It sets the parameter language in particular. You know, it's the terrain on which we think and talk to each other. Um, so, and it's the way in which we imagine the world. Um, but of course, it, we don't imagine the world under conditions uh, invented by ourselves, but under conditions given to us. So, uh, when er, when when the way I t the way I think about it, which is the way Raymond Williams thinks about it, I mean Raymond Williams keywords is the inspiration uh, for my project. That's keywords of vocabulary of culture and society from 1976. Right, um, and so he defines the keyword as a binding word in certain activities and in their interpretation. 
So binding, I think, is a kind of carefully chosen word that has a couple of different meanings, both in the sense that the keywords that he talks about and which I talk about too, kind of bind us together. They're a shared vocabulary and a shared sense of meanings, but they are also kind of manacles. They also constrain the way that we communicate and think. So they bind us um, in ways that are perhaps positive sometimes and um, in ways that are restrictive. And, you know, and a keyword is also, it's a key uh, in the sense, in a double sense as well. It opens something up. It allows us, I think, this is what I find attractive about this kind of way of writing and um, and of, of reading, is that it opens up something that might have been hidden or hard to see. And it also is important and underscores something that we need to pay attention to. So uh, when I'm choosing, uh, I have so much diff- somewhat different selection criteria than Ray Williams did, but um, the idea behind each of these words for me is that they open up some aspect of contemporary economic existence that I think it's generally the desire of ruling class ideologues, whoever they are, to to keep under under lock. In terms of the intellectual history you're working from, before Williams, there was Russian linguist Valentin Volishinov, who argued, you write, quote, language is an ideological battlement, as well as an archive of past political struggles. Explain Volishinov's approach. And, and also, if I remember correctly, I, I think there's there's some debate over whether some things written by Volishinov were actually written by his colleague, linguist Mikhail Bakhtin. I don't know if that's right, but what his argument reveals about language and power. Yeah, there's also some theories that Voloshinov and Mikhail Bakhtin are actually the same person. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so I don't know and or really care that much about that particular controversy, <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave that to others. But it's kind of interesting. <laughs> so, but what he he's trying to bring Marxism to bear on linguistics in the uh, 1920s. And he's a, a source for Williams's work as well. And so what he and, and also Bakhtin <laughs> shared this conviction that language, Bakhtin, you know, is, is a literary critic and writing about language uh, in terms of the analysis of, of literature. Language is a, a terrain of social conflict and where, where we fight out kind of social struggles. And Voloshinov considers language to be kind of vital and dynamic, and he, what he calls multi accentuality is a is a pro, is a, a feature of kind of all spoken and written language so you know everyday speech the way we communicate contains what he calls social accents the kind of glimmers or surviving traces of other people's ways of speaking of other kind of meanings uh, lost or suppressed or fallen by the wayside over as time passes uh, and so he says that in any kind of linguistic, shared linguistic community, uh, dominant and authoritative accents, the, the language spoken by people of means and people with authority, um, always compete with other overlooked, misunderstood, or silenced voices. And so what he's trying to do, and this kind of historically and politically informed language analysis that he inspires Williams to do, is to use language as a kind of uh, archive of those meanings and of those struggles, you know, as a place where certain traces are left, like a, like a fossil almost. And, and the archive is indeed deep. M- many of the keywords that you analyze speak the language of rebellion, both, both secular and religious, including obvious examples like disrupt and less obvious ones like innovate, which I did not know had this negative connotation. You, you write that innovate was a pejorative term dating back hundreds of years, if I recall correctly, um, to describe those who worked, quote, against the established order, whether in heaven or on earth. Right. Now, of course, it's something that professionals do to make better products for us and just to make our, maybe even more so to make our lives better, generally speaking. You write, quote, this paradoxical combination of heroic anti-orthodoxy and process-driven orthodoxy 
makes innovation a virtue of a contradictory age. Explain this term, innovation, and what you see as being these contradictions that this keyword provisionally attempts to resolve. So the the first aspect of the contradiction, the heroic anti-orthodoxy, uh, that's the oldest meaning of the word. Um, and it derives from roughly the early modern period, you know, the 16th, uh, 17th century. And it refers to a, an act to innovate is to do something decisive in the world, to, in, to reinterpret the word of God, uh, and to put yourself in the position of being a uh, interpreter and a, or in a prophet of God's will. Which Ecclesiastes and St. Augustine alike tell us is, is not a good thing. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun is the biblical warning against innovation because, you know, and, and to create, this is a related, innovation and creativity have a shared history in this respect. To create is something that only God can do, you know, until, until surprisingly released recently. Uh, the, the idea of creativity as a human trait is a pretty recent development. So if you're innovating, you're undermining or overthrowing something established. So one of the kind of strange things about reading this history of innovation is that if you're if you're like me and and you and you hate the word and you are exasperated by its appearance finding in the uh examples of its use from catholic reactionaries from the 19th century you can really find some good some good quotes <laughs> you know from from when Edmund Burke decries the slime of the filthy awful of the innovators of Paris, I, um, I find myself kind of nodding along until I remember what Edmund Burke's talking about. But innov so innovation was something regularly denounced until the, the Protestant Reformation starts to, of course, transform this over a period of you know, decades and centuries because uh, Francis Bacon, philosopher and um, politician in Britain, points out quite reasonably that uh, the Protestant Reformation is itself an innovation. So how can one be against innovation and then uh, before Protestantism at the same time? So it starts to kind of change there. And then it becomes in the 19th century more of a, a process rather than an act. So in other words, you no longer innovate the word of God or innovate government. You pursue innovations in the world in building a new kind of engine or a building a new distribution system for your project for your product so innovation becomes a process that that happens in the world rather than something that takes place in heaven or uh, with heaven's representatives on earth and that's where we are now yeah and remarkably today innovation doesn't even require that any particular product or entity or institution be the object of in a innovation. It's it's something more abstract. You, you cite a Harvard Business Review article entitled, Who's the Best at Innovating Innovation? Well, yeah. what, what is innovation in this fully abstracted sense? Well, so that phrase, you know, delighted me in, to some degree. I mean, it, I thought because, I, because it was just such nonsense to innovate innovation. Um, it, it seems to describe some just like circular, endless tail chasing, you know, but I think in that phrase, there are traces of, this is sort of to go back to Voloshinov's, there's sort of traces of the earlier accents of innovation as a religious prophecy, because there's something so detached from material reality about it. There's something so abstract about it. Um, there's also something so supposedly visionary about the way innovate is used in that phrase, you know, so to innovate, innovation, not to innovate anything in particular, but just to sort of innovate is to do that kind of work of visionary prophecy that is the first meaning of the, of the verb. Of course, it's, you know, it's, it's done in the service, as hard as a business review would say of, you know, finding a better way to sell iPhones or something, but, but in the phrase, in the, the way the phrase gets used in a in a in a celebratory way now that old false prophecy 
that innovation used to mean is is now a positive thing is now a valorized thing but it contains traces of that of that old prophetic meaning that it used to have similarly many companies emphasize that they provide solutions rather than emphasizing whatever it is that they might purport to be solving and you suggest that the vacuousness surrounding language like this is rooted often in its appeal to the supposedly value-neutral quality of technology. It explains solutions in particular and your broader argument about the ideological power of appeals to technology. Well, solutions, the plural solutions, you know, everybody, I think, has seen that kind of word proliferate in the last few years, the the way that pretty much any kind of business application or business process is described as somebody providing customer service solutions or or whatever. So I think it's its origin dates from the nineties and the software industry. And part of what it does is that it kind of suggests a problem without necessarily naming one. You know, whatever you're doing is solving something. Solutions are here to fix whatever needs fixing. But it but it is also performs an additional service of mystifying what the company actually does. So a company called Network Solutions, which is one of the first uh, cases in which the, the word appeared prominently in the name of a, of a company, which was Network Solutions was the company that was earned the contract to assign web addresses when the Internet was first being developed. Networks, if you had to say what Network Solutions actually does with, by looking at its name, you would never have an idea. You know, it's so detached from any actual task. And what they were doing was actually profiting from being World Wide Web rentiers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. So the rise of solutions, like other words that I talk about that are kind of related, like best practices and competencies um, and and smart uh, is an example of the separation in, in corporate culture and business culture of separating practices and technologies from, from what they do, from their effects, kind of as you were suggesting. So the value neutrality of this kind of technological language and of other and, and of business language like solutions and competencies is really a fundamental part of, of what this language does. And, and you can see it in a lot of the words I talk about in the book. You know, I teach English, so I teacher writing. And one of the things that I always repeat to students is that in order to write a clear and compelling sentence, you have to be clear about what the action is and who the subject is and who the object is. So what is happening, who's doing it, and who's it being done to? Avoid passive voice. Right. So a predominant feature of a lot of the language of 21st century capitalism, of neoliberalism, of late capitalism, or whatever we want to call it, is based around uh, mystifying and obscuring the agents and the things that they're doing. So the vagueness of solutions, the kind of mystical visionary innovator or innovation, the way in which your boss is now your uh, now a leader among many other leaders at a at a at a company. So. So you know nobody nobody's doing anything to anybody else. Nobody is exploiting anybody else. Nobody is working for anybody else. We're collaborating. We are all leaders in our respective tasks no matter where we are, no matter if we're the boss or the person who cleans the boss's office, we can still be a a leader in office management solutions, <laughs> you might call it. Uh so that's one of the fundamental things I think this language does. It's it's about evading agency and evading the basic question of who's doing what to whom. Yeah, I want to talk more about how it obscures agency by rendering labor invisible. Yeah. There are all these ways to talk about the workplace without talking about workers, let alone the working class. One is is human capital, which makes labor into capital. And there can't be a conflict between labor and capital if, if everything's capital. Mm -hmm. You write, quote, the ideology of human capital turns the toil we do for our bosses into something we do for our future selves and the work we do for our future selves into something we do for our future bosses. And, quote, work is labor, exhausting, exploitative, but performed with and for others, 
fades into the background of work as the acquisition of self. Human capital seems like a skeleton key of sorts to a, a broader class of your keywords. Mm-hmm. How, do, how did labor become mystified as human capital? And how does actual capital benefit as a result? The Well, the history of, of human capital as a concept is, is a kind of interesting one uh, because when it was first developed about, I have to, check this to be absolutely sure, but about 40 years ago, um, it was a controversial term and its, its first theorists were, were worried about the fact that it sounds like slavery to talk about human capital, which it does, (laughs) um, you know, because that's because enslaved people were human capital. Um, and so there's this interesting article in which one of the economists who who theorizes the concept kind of frets about this and concludes that ultimately one of the advantages of the concept is that it is about uh, imbuing what you might call the worker with a sense of control over the capital that they generate. So there's a way in which it kind of slightly incorporates a certain bedrock Marxist principle about capital as the product of exploited labor so you're not a worker, you're human capital, but you are your own human. You, you control your human capital. Your labor power is yours. Yeah, right. That's the, that's the kind of allure of the idea. So, of course, one of the other attractive parts of the idea from the per- perspective of, you know, of management is that in setting you free, so to speak, as human capital that you yourself control, it also absolves the company of the obligation to do things like train you or provide you with tuition benefits at a local community college to, or, or something to learn your work better or to offer job security or something. Because it, in granting to the worker the sort of the, the, the freedom of being their own human capital, it also outsources the risk of developing human capital to the worker. You no longer have to, you don't have to pay for them to or invest a lot of time in training them because it's their their job now to invest in themselves, right? And so, and that's another uh, that's another kind of common thread in the the words that I talk about, and in I think just um, more broadly the culture of contemporary capitalism is this offloading of risk onto workers and selling it as a kind of liberation. And there's a certain way in which that sell that salesmanship can can often be very seductive and very convincing. It's not just that only suckers believe in human capital or you know only only chumps buy into this kind of stuff. It's a very seductive idea and it permeates everybody's experience of their working life, you know, mine included. Well, and the logic of the system can even make it logical for an individual to think about it that way. Yeah. Right. So, you know, the the idea of passion is, an, is a good example of this, where, and passion also shares with innovation, uh, you know, a kind of secret religious uh, lineage that you might not think about when you're talking about um, pursuing your passion through your job. You know, people who teach, people who are nurses, people who are caretakers, do those things out of a sense of devotion to other people. But the problem is that you are expected to be kind of compensated in passion. Passion supplements and in, in many cases replaces wages that, uh, that you're not getting. And that functions in a highly gendered way too, for care work in particular. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the way that, you know, emotional labor often performed by women is work whose value is measured in terms of how well you can manage the passions of other people and how well you can kind of perform um, emotions or passions yourself. You know, look at to be an airline steward is the classic example of it. You have to be able to make people feel good, and you also have to show, perform that you yourself are happy to make them feel good. So, what makes this idea though also very insidious is the way that it kind of draws on a certain kind of critique of of work under capitalism that it's alienating that it 
you know, that you're just performing drudgery for someone else's benefit. You're not getting You're not able to spend eight hours of every day of your life doing something you care about and doing something that matters to you. And so in seeming to um, redress that deficit, that problem of, you know, what in a, a kind of more Marxist vocabulary would be called alienation, it binds you closer to the, to your boss, to the company, you know, because, um, you're performing this, this kind of passion or you're pursuing this kind of passion because you care about it, not because you're forced to. And then capitalists then take advantage of that to increase your exploitation. That's pretty sinister. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, you know, and I'm saying this as somebody who's totally subject to this, uh, seduction. Like I wrote, I wrote this book, for that reason, you know, and I didn't expect to be, um, didn't expect to be paid for it. You know, academics, which I'm sort of still one, are the worst offenders in the world, and myself is totally included in conflating their own personal desires with the interests of their employer. You know, so it's something. It's not just something that like only a dumb person would would fall victim to. You know, I want to be clear about that. It's it's this is like something that's very hard to to get away from other keywords render both capitalists and workers invisible by locating agency and power in suprahuman, suprasocial and suprapolitical forces. The market, Mm -hmm. of course, is a disembodied naturalized force with human attributes. It can get skittish or whatever, all kinds of other feelings. Yeah, the sluggish, sluggish or skittish market. And so it's this force that governs humans rather than being governed by us, which in turn fosters this notion that that markets can either be restrained or freed, which obscures the fact that they're always structured by politics and material relations. There's no kind of like natural market looking to to burst forth. And then a, a Another term is is ecosystem to describe businesses or sectors of the economy. And that performs a, a similar feat of, in this case, very literal naturalization. You can't blame the apex predator capitalist if they're just performing ecosystem services. <laughs> yeah. And so both words invoke things as not made, but rather as things that just are and thus that we just have to respond to them as they are. Right. What are the, the origins and, and function of this capitalist cosmovision? Yeah, that's a, that's a great phrase for it. Um, so to take the example of the market first, you know, one really important point that stuck with me uh, from Quinn Slobodian's book on neoliberalism, which I know you know. Excellent. <laughs> it's an excellent book. He's been on your show talking about it, is that he points out uh, somewhere in the book that there's this adjective, unfettered, that you never hear in any other context except to modify the word market. And it's often used by people who are critics of of uh, of the right or of you know so-called free market um, economics. So the unfettered market, you know, you never, you, no one ever says fettered anymore in any other context. And, you know, it suggests this acceptance, almost a kind of unthinking acceptance of the, the lie of the naturalness of the market. You know, this idea that it's bound by chains and the, what conservatives are trying to do is to break those chains rather than, as Slobodian argues, to... Uh, encase it or to to create new structures and institutions by which the market can um, dominate. And to protect it specifically from the intervention of democratic peoples and states. Right, exactly. Uh, and so again, to to uh, to obscure at a fun in a fundamental way, like who is doing what to whom and who is benefiting. So part of what these kind of words are doing is, you know, as you said, is to naturalize capitalism and to make it seem as if it is the only possible system that we can imagine. So ecosystem uh, is something that 
you hear all the time, like the the maker ecosystem of a particular city, the Microsoft ecosystem, and then the innovation ecosystem uh, is a very common phrase. So the ecosystem is one of a, a several ecological metaphors that circulate in business culture and that I talk about. Synergy is one. You say um, it's on the way out. <laughs> it's on the way out. It's kind of a, I think everybody rolls their eyes at synergy now, but it's, but it, but it's been so thoroughly uh, incorporated by business rhetoric that I think no one remembers that it was originally a, a biological concept. So the business climate is another good example, which is sort of related to, to ecosystem. You know, green fields, blue skies, um, incubators. There's all these kinds of scientific or ecological terms that you hear all the time. And ecosystem has like a, unlike a lot of the words I talk about, it does have a sort of uh, beginning. In a Harvard Business Review article from 1993, called Predators and Prey, A New Ecology of Competition. So what the author, uh, Sky James Moore, says is that business systems condense from the original swirl of capital, which is kind of imagines like a big bang in, or like a moment of creation. And, and ecosystems are kind of what result from this kind of original chaos. Um, and his writing is typical of a lot of the kind of business management writing that I had to read a lot of for this book in that it's, it plays very fast and loose and kind of very sloppily with analogy. And it hangs a lot of f fundamental arguments on just analogies or just loose associations. So just if I could just read you an example, he writes... Business ecosystems condense out of the original swirl of capital, con customer interest, and talent generated by a new innovation, just as successful species spring from the natural resources of sunlight, water, and soil nutrients. So, I mean, if you, if you accept that extremely dubious analogy, everything that's contained in that just as phrase, you know, a lot of it, a lot of what will follow makes sense. But if you question, as any, I think, careful reader would that um, I'm not sure that cons customer interest is exactly the same as water or that talent and soil nutrients <laughs> are particularly analogous things. Then, then uh... yeah, it, it, it attempts to prove the correctness <laughs> of the analogy by defining what is being analogized. Yeah. It's very like tautological. <laughs> I mean, it's circular. It doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. And if you come from outside that world, like, you know, like I do as a reader, it's kind of baffling that that kind of circular logic um, can hold. So, so basically the idea of the ecosystem, the business ecosystem, it imagines that a particular the business in a particular place, because, you know, a business ecosystem is just something that's defined like something by a regional area or by a particular industry or something. So within that, that limited sphere, there are predators and there are prey. There are winners and there are losers, but there is also a kind paradoxically, there's also a kind of balance. It's the circle of life. <laughs> yes. Part of the, part of the assumption, part of the kind of like lazy biological assumption is this idea that nature is always in balance or wants to always be in balance. And so therefore the, business ecosystem is always also in balance. Yeah, the predator eats the weak prey, which, you know, we're not supposed to think of as sad for that individual prey, as, but part of the broader system, the predator then, like, poo, you know, ex excretes the prey, which then grows crops, and, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's 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 all... It might be a little bloody when you look up too close, but at the macro level, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, and so if you ask yourself, well, who's the prey here? Am I the prey? Um, am I the thing being eaten and shat out on the savanna, you know, in this business ecosystem that I work in, um, it could start to get a little, a little, uh, nerve wracking, but those kinds of questions are not, which I think are, are kind of obviously raised by the whole metaphor, uh, are not of course pursued in the literature on the business ecosystem. So, so there's this like allusion to conflict, 
which is never really pursued and, and whose implications are not reflected upon. But then it is also the celebration of the will to balance of nature. Um, so it's fair, you know, it's basically a fair system. Um, and then also the, unpre- the, the joyous unpredictability of the natural world or the serendipity, which is another big business word, natural serendipity, you know, in which great ideas spark by some accidental encounter between two like-minded people or something. It's also this, this idea that the goodness or, or justness of the economy is best grasped by measurements of the, the size or, or growth of the economy as a whole. It's like deeply embedded in the way, ingrained in the way that we think about the economy often in terms of GDP. And not in terms of capital and labor, right? Because in in a business ecosystem imagined in this way, um, there may be predators and prey, but it's the way it should be. And there's no one is, uh, and it's and it's fundamentally in balance. It's fundamentally fair. So it's not shaped by a particular kind of unfairness or of conflict or even Gini coefficient you know there are other data points that could be used as well yeah yeah that looked at the relationship between parts rather than just the whole yeah and so one of my favorite uh examples from the ecosystem literature is from this theorist named deborah jackson she writes ideally the ecosystem is also structured to recover and recycle resources including human capital that are released upon failure of an enterprise and this kind of alludes to your uh, point about the excretions of a uh, business ecosystem. They make for good compost. Yeah, what's what's being suggested there is that uh, if you work for a company and you get fired, you're the metaphorical compost of a business enterprise. So, you know, you can take heart from the fact that you'll be the soil in which something else grows, but in the meantime, you know, you're dead, I guess. Ecosystem is also part of this pseudo-collectivist side to this labor erasure language. Workplaces with open plans emphasize collaboration where where team members don't meet but rather have huddles. Mm -hmm. We hail cars and rent rooms by way of a sharing economy. Stakeholders are, of course, all on the same team. How do these invocations of cooperation obscure hierarchy well so what they do is they uh posit an enterprise as something neutral and as a kind of cooperative endeavor um the examples that you mentioned say the stakeholder for example there's a kind of basic irony in that word because the the stake that is being referenced in that word is a this, the idea of a stake as a financial stake. So someone holds a financial stake in a venture. Obviously, people hold different size stakes in a venture. And then some of those stakes re- get a good return and some don't. So like baked into the word is this basic inequality that one has to recognize if you're talking about finance. I mean, even if you love finance, you you know, you you have to recognize that it's not an egalitarian sphere. Some people have minority stakes. Some people have majority stakes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and and some people have no stake at all. And and that was kind of the um, the impetus behind the development of the of the concept during the Great Depression. It was a, a Harvard law professor named Merrick Dodd who first sort of started developing the idea of the stakeholder. And it was in response. Like a lot of like innovation kind of was too, a response to the unpopularity of industry during the Great Depression, when people widely felt, I would say, obviously correctly, that business was exploitative and unfair. And so there was this need to kind of recuperate uh, in the business world or in the, on the right in the United States, recuperate the reputation of business and industry. And so one of the things Dodd was concerned with was to argue that business and industry needed to be more aware of and more concerned with their effect on the broader community of which business is a part. So any kind of, any kind of business had stakeholders that the, the workers, 
the owner of the coffee shop down the street from the factory, the teachers at the public school near the factory, the you know the restaurants in the town, etc. And so uh, when industrialists were making particular decisions, they should incorporate uh, the interests of these various stakeholders. So that was the kind of idea. It's, it's the introduction of the idea of corporate responsibility, basically, is the stakeholder concept. Now, of course, he's right in the sense that uh, the public school teacher in the neighborhood school and the owner of the coffee shop down the street do depend on the factory and on the firm nearby. But what Merrick Dodd is is not asking for in that article where he introduces stakeholderism is that firms should be legally bound or restricted in terms of what they do by by what effect it'll have on the neighborhood, but that it should voluntarily uh, take upon itself this responsibility. Um, and in that way, what's what the idea of the stakeholder obscures is just the power dynamics that obtain in any kind of enterprise. And it uh, asks us to believe that we are all holders of a similar or shared stake in the success of uh, General Motors or, or whatever. And that, you know, and that's plainly not true, but the word, and I think it's proliferation seduces us with the possibility that it is. I think one of the things that's important about uh, a lot of the words that I talk about and sharing is a good example of how what seems to be very new about neoliberalism is can sometimes be a bit deceptive uh, because as even as the vocabulary changes and the technologies change, uh, often what they're doing is recapitulating just the same old techniques of replacing labor or of mechanizing it or of extracting more surplus from it. So sharing is a word that at first glance, and you know, in, a, in, in its economic usages, of course, seems to be something that's uh, very 21st century, you know, the sharing economy or peer to peer. So, you know, it's a thing we do voluntarily, a thing we do for each other. It seems to almost suggest something like solidarity. And that's like the fantasy of the of the sharing economy, you know, like the fantasy Airbnb sells of people opening up their homes and you can meet anybody and live this kind of live the life of a local in whatever town you visit. And, you know, we all know, of course, if you ever use an Airbnb, that that's almost never the case. It's just an apartment owned by some landlord. It's all full of apartments, empty apartments. But the sharing, the idea of the sharing economy is that it's this kind of horizontal economy that grants workers in it a certain sense of agency and autonomy so when you get an uber you can you'll meet some some new person from a new walk of life and they're doing it on their free time or in their off hours or whenever they want but really what if you kind of take a somewhat historical perspective on these things the sharing economy is is kind of an updated version of sharecropping that uses new technological tools to accomplish the old task of binding workers to the owner of the tools by forcing them to use them. And then these employers have no responsibility to right. those workers because it's this emphasis on the technology of the platform as though that's at the core of what's happening and what's what's novel or what's what's important about th this industry when, when the big thing about the sharing economy is just like you're saying, the old school casualization of labor relations. Because you could, of course, have a taxi hailing app that summoned taxi drivers formally employed by the app. Right. Or or even better, taxi drivers who owned the app. Right. And instead and and so this emphasis on the um the the platform and on the technology and on the novelty of the technology I think can sometimes blind us to how just how old the actual model is and, and how uninnovative, if, if I may say so, it is. I'm Aziz Rana, and you're listening to The Dig, a great place for analysis about where we are, how we got here, and what can be done. It's my favorite podcast, and you can support it at patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, 
perfect for dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Edward Said, his thought as a novel by Dominique Ede. In this personal portrait of Edward Said written by a close friend, Dominique Ede offers a fascinating and fresh presentation of his work. From his earliest writings on Joseph Conrad to his most famous texts, Orientalism and Culture and Imperialism, Ede weaves together accounts of the genesis and content of Said's work, his intellectual development, and her own reflections and personal recollections of their friendship, which began in 1979 and lasted until Said's death in 2003. Throughout, she traces the connection between personal history and theoretical options, illuminating the evolution of Said's thought. Both specialists of Said's work and newcomers will find much to learn in this rich portrait of one of the 20th century's most important intellectuals. Edward Said, His Thought as a Novel, by Dominique Ede, out now from Verso Books. You write, quote, The body talk of contemporary capitalism imagines corporate businesses as bodies in virtually every way, except as a group of overextended and underpaid ones. And, quote, Austerity culture seems to demand a sort of embodied moral discipline, like that of the ascetic in the wilderness, trimmed of excess bulk, devoted to a single task, scornful of leisure that might detract from it. Austerity, in other words, is a, a permanent fitness routine that makes the good great and the bad, well, too bad for them if they didn't adapt. Why are body metaphors used so commonly to describe corporate entities in late capitalism? So partly because they uh, they always have at some level. I mean, the the whole the very word corporation is itself a bodily metaphor that imagines a firm as a as a human body. And corporate personhood goes back to what, the 19th century? Uh, at least, yeah. The legal doctrine? Yeah. Yeah. So, again, like why it does that is because you know, a, a kind of basic objective of capitalist ideology is always uh to obscure exploitation, you know, to so to imagine something imagine a, a workplace as something otherwise than a place of uh, exploitation is is what is always the objective. So, but what I guess what the particular proliferation of what I would call body talk does, and I think you know this is always the point, and this is something that Raymond Williams always emphasizes that it's to talk about language isn't to talk about correct usages or whether someone's using the word in the right way or whether it means something or not, but to emphasize how people are using it and to what effect like the, one of my um, favorite examples, which is to say also the example I hate the most is (laughs) uh, flexibility and uh, flexibility can have two different meanings that it's very sort of class uh, marked, which meaning it has. So, if you have a flexible schedule at a professional office job where you have a certain degree of job security, uh, you may be allowed to telecommute or you may be allowed a generous, you know, quote unquote, generous um, allotment of parental leave if you've just had a child or if uh, you're caring for somebody. So that's flexibility in a, you know, fairly in a good sense. Uh, the other meaning of uh, flexible scheduling, though, is what people in the service economy have to confront. If you work in retail or if you work in a customer service kind of job or, if, you know, you work in a in a restaurant or a fast food place or something, flexible scheduling means not having a sta- stable schedule and having a computer determine when you work shortly before you work. Right. So to avoid the boss having to pay you to come in every morning at 8 a.m. when on Wednesdays at 8 a.m. you're not they don't really need you as much as they do on Thursdays at 6 a.m. or something. So it's this way of constantly um, moving workers around in ways that are unpredictable. But from the 
boss's point of view, uh, flexible. So flexibility is a kind of concept that again, sounds, you may, you know, it sounds good, you know, to be flexible is to be agile. It's an ability. It's a skill. It's a, it's a kind of athletic gymnastic achievement. Um, but what you're in most cases doing is bending to the will of your employer and having to bend in all kinds of painful and more and more, um, I think for more, for more and more people, uncomfortable or untenable directions in order to, to satisfy their employer and to keep their job. So that's one of the things that a lot of the, a lot of the examples of the body talk, like nimble is about framing work as a kind of athletic contest. And that's where nimble, you know, nimble used to only appear in the sports section in the, in, in journalism. And now it appears mostly in the business section. So, uh, a nimble company is a company that has laid off people in most every case, you know, it's a company that has trimmed its trimmed is another, you know, related kind of popular verb has trimmed its uh, excess labor costs. Just like, it's, you know, it's slimmed down, you know, to use, to go back to the idea of, uh, contemporary working life as this kind of uh, maniacal exercise routine that never ends, you know? And the point is that it, uh, it, it frames work as an athletic contest, thus governed by rules that are transparent and that are applied every time where an umpire always calls you in or out fairly and in which you can win if you're good enough and if you're strong enough and if you are willing to put in the hours. Uh, another keyword like flexible where there's a sort of class differentiated meaning is brand. You, you, you note that while white collar strivers, successful and not, must develop personal brands, blue collar service workers must wear the uniform brand of their company on their uniform, something much more like the cattle brand that the word derives from. And in a lot of a lot of these keywords, you write, quote, come from what we might broadly describe as office work, whether it is the language used by the human resources manager, the aspirational founder, or the white-collar proletarian whose clerical duties make the office go. So why do words that, that govern the economy as a whole and, our, and late capitalist culture as a whole refer explicitly more to just a small segment of its workforce? Yeah. And, and what does that do? Yeah. I mean, you, know, you think about, I was just alluding to the business section, you know, which is the section of the newspaper that talks about uh, economics and it's never called the labor section. You know, it's always <laughs> called the business section. So, um, drives me. Oh man. <laughs> so, so what's that about? I mean, obviously I think maybe it's obvious. The point is to, um, to valorize the decisions of business people and to kind of render invisible or just sort of, uh, supplementary the work, of the laborer. And, you know, that's something that I guess a lot of the words in my book do. And that's, again, something that the language of capitalism has always endeavored to do. You know, it's not something that just started in the 21st century. So, so part of it is simply the, the, the impetus to minimize and to denigrate the work that workers do, you know? And so when you, if you read the business section, if you read the business press, you could be, excused if that was your only knowledge of what working life was like from thinking that no one does a job that is hot and sweaty and exhausting and boring, which most people, of course, do, whether you work in an office or not, actually. So that's the first thing. I mean, but then there's, an, there's another element of it that I think does have a somewhat more recent history, and that's the the development over the last you know, 50 years or so of this concept of knowledge work, the knowledge economy and knowledge worker. This is a concept that Peter Drucker is this giant of management studies. And if you go to business school, if you study business, I think you have to read him. He's a, a kind of giant figure. And in 1968, he, in a book, he coins the concept of knowledge work. And like we were talking about with innovation and creativity, Part of what the concept of knowledge work is meant to do is to redeem 
capitalism and working life from the critique that many made, especially in 1968, that it was alienated and that it was dull and it was bureaucratic. You know, this sort of idea of work as just trudging off to the assembly line, doing the same thing for eight hours and then trudging home or trudging off to the office, doing the same thing for eight hours and driving home to your dull suburb. That kind of had become a very prominent critique of the way American capitalism operated. So for Drucker and then for a lot of the management thinkers he's inspired, mechanical became like a really dirty word. So to the degree that the contemporary economy was mechanical, it was dull, it was alienating. And knowledge work was, in his estimation, a way of liberating yourself from the drudgery that had uh, dominated a kind of economy characterized by factory work before. And to read him talking about knowledge work now, the, the, the hope he invests it with, you know, you, you can be anything you want. You can be a writer today. You can be a electrician tomorrow. You can be a painter. You can work in a business. You know, you, <laughs> the possibilities are endless. Sounds like Marx's vision of communism. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's weirdly kind of like that yeah <laughs> instead of fishing in the morning and hunting in the afternoon you can uh innovate in software in the morning <laughs> and do design thinking <laughs> in the afternoon or something but it's this sense of like possibility that comes from a transition from industrial work to knowledge work and you know the question of like well who's going to make all the stuff doesn't really get addressed but that's the idea. So like a lot of the, the, a lot of this kind of culture and a lot of the vocabulary of contemporary capitalism comes out of this critique of the mechanization and alienation of actual work. And it's, it's attempt to kind of redeem industrial life from those critiques. Relatedly, there's a lot of art talk that you identify in late capitalism. Artisanal, yeah. collaboration, creative, curator, maker... And you cite Luke Boltanski and Eve Chiapello's argument about the appropriation of the aesthetic critique of capitalism by capitalism. Mm -hmm. Another example is DIY, which is in part taken from punk rock. Hacker, which yeah. like a lot of Silicon Valley draws from this whole whole earth catalog style countercultural 60s hippie milieu. It, it, explain this. And why the appeal to art proves so powerful, given that the very category of art initially derives from this distinction made between art and productive labor. Yeah, so um, that's a good point. That's a good way of framing it. I mean, the the history of the word creativity is that history of, first of all, cre creation being separated from God being something that you know you or I could do. And then creativity being divided into aesthetic creativity, something that an artist does, and then um, productive creation, which is something that a farmer or a or a cook does, which is not valorized as much and is not celebrated as being visionary or genius. You know, only if you're a chef, and if you're a chef, you're an artist. You know, in the kitchen, and if you're a cook, you're just you know. And if you're a sandwich artist, you're being mocked by your boss. <laughs> right. Exactly. So that gender distinction of the male chef, the female cook, the, sh the, the artist chef, the, the cook who just puts food on the table every night, that, that very gender distinction has all kinds of other you know, examples, like the gardener, the farmer also. But it's a distinction and you can kind of trace as you start to pry open this keyword of creativity, I think. And it's that association of of the creative artist with a particular kind of genius and also it's disassociation from work you know the idea that uh, being a chef is somehow like not hot and sweaty and miserable sometimes or being a painter is something you do with other people and something you pay other people to help you do and it's you know it's a whole there's a whole 
labor economy built into it? No, no. It, it just feels like you're on MDMA constantly. <laughs> it just emerges from the... Just like flows. From the genius, yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel when I'm writing down. Yeah, uh, yeah, yep, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think it's that, that affiliation with that kind of um, non-laboring genius that is behind the management literature world's love of these kind of artistic metaphors of creativity, of the creative class, passion, as we were talking about before. So, so yeah, partly it's about like appropriating the prestige and also the uh, intellectual... Gravitas, status. Gravitas, thank you. Yeah, status that's associated with art. Well, part of the other part of it is you know what Boltanski and Chapello argue in their in their book when they're talking about the artistic critique is the incorporation or, or you know appropriation of critiques of life under capitalism as something that could actually you know be used to bind people more to consumerism and to working life. On that point, you you write that it it seems as though quote. This old breach between the imaginative and the productive has partly been closed when we think of these terms like a creative being a member of the creative class and people curating not just museums but clothing. And I think it's been partly closed, but I also think Mm -hmm. what we've been talking about shows that it's also been displaced and then recapitulated within the labor market to distinguish between highly valued knowledge workers and low valued service workers. Right. Yeah. So, and that's another, that's also a gender distinction in many cases. So, you know, I think the history of the word curator is a good example here because uh, it has a kind of aesthetic meaning, of course, from the muse- the idea of the museum curator. But the root of the word cura, you know, is Latin f- word for care. And so a curator is someone who is responsible for caring for something, whether someone else or for a particularly valued object or something. And in the entry for curator, I talk about this uh, slogan, which I love from the Harvard Union campaign for you know, clerical workers, mostly female clerical workers at Harvard in the 70s, which was you can't eat prestige was the slogan. And that's what I think the valorization of curation as, you know, you work in a store, you're a curator of whatever you sell in the store, you work, you're a bartender, you're a uh, cocktail curator your meager wages are supplemented with prestige, just sort of in the same way that we saw with passion. And it's a, it's a way in which the work of caring has, as you said, been displaced and also kind of rendered uh, invisible as something that is that looks like work. Originally, in, I guess, beginning in the late 19th century, there's this distinction between art and labor yeah. that develops. And then what seems to be happening now is that that distinction is recapitulated within the labor market. Yeah, right. So certain kinds of work are an art, and then certain kinds of work are mere labor. Um, and that's a gender distinction, It's and it's a class distinction. And it's a racialized distinction, too. You, you write that this company called IDEO embraced design thinking by arguing that the rise of Asian manufacturing meant that the West's comparative advantage— would be in right-brained creative activities. And because the Asian economies were rising because of manufacturing, these the notion, this Orientalist idea that it's that Asian economic growth is rooted in rigid left-brained labor, which is ironic because it comes out of a milieu that also draws on a contradictory Orientalist trope in the form of a hackneyed appropriation of Eastern spirituality, which used Asia, Asian culture, to critique Western conformity. <laughs> yeah, right. That's no, that's a great point. The um, so as IDEO starts to get outbid for me- mechanical engineering design jobs, so they're like they're famous for designing the Apple Mouse and um, and other things. That's kind of the thing that they're most famous for. But they start to lose out on those kind of jobs to cheaper 
design firms in China, I think, in particular. And Lily Arani is a scholar who's written about this history really well, who I uh, rely on a lot for this uh, part of the argument, by the way. And so as they start to lose those kinds of jobs, they, to cite one another of my keywords, they pivot to basically management consulting, but they call it design thinking. And, you, you know, I hear this kind of argument in a lot of other capacities, like, you know, in higher education, a, a, a defense that's often made for things like history and English and art and the humanities in general is that, well, you can never outsource empathy or something. You can never outsource the kind of artistic or creative knowledge that those disciplines uh, are, are said to focus on. And so we, like, it's supposed to be a measure of job security that you can defend this realm of uh, the right-brained design thinking. But if I can go, just to go back to the point about the, the contradictory invocation of Asia. So Asia, Asia in, the, in, the, in the specific case of Japan and China, gets invoked time and time again in, in the histories of the words that I talk about because, and in ways that are internally contradictory, as you just, as you just suggested. So often Japan in the 80s, and in words that have more of an 80s lineage, like best practices and competencies, and lean, which was a concept developed by Toyota, the strength of Japanese manufacturing and of the Japanese economy in general is always the flexibility of Japanese workers, their ability to kind of do multiple different things, their ability to kind of transform from a tool and die operator in one, you know, in the case of like a Toyota plant to some other kind of worker elsewhere to do multiple jobs to have multiple competencies that's the kind of idea of of the competency is these like you're not bound to one repetitive skill but you can do many different things and then you have the complete opposite in the case of design thinking in which just a few years later you have the 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 chinese product engineer imagined as the exact opposite as somebody who's rode in mechanical and methodical um, and then in the context, in, in the case of leadership, um, ideas of the empathic spiritual leader that uh, is, has been a mainstay of self-help books for about a century or more draws on, as you were saying, on, on these kind of uh, phony notions of Eastern spirituality. And that includes like uh, Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking? 1952. Yes. And so you can see like, so Asia gets invoked in, in, in these sort of opportunistic ways as, as a kind of enemy that must be defeated. You know, the Japanese have to be prevented from conquering U.S. manufacturing in, in the way that the Chinese are now invoked. But to go back to the original point, you know, as well, the this, this kind of distinction between art and labor, between uh, between feminized emotional labor or between artistic leadership, which is gendered male, breaks down in all kinds of different ways, racial, gendered, and other in other kinds. Because West, because like white white Western thinking is here feminized and celebrated as flexible and creative, whereas the Orientalist framing of Asian thinking is as kind of rigidly masculine yeah and the ideal of leadership business leadership that's often celebrated in business schools and in the business press is linked with certain feminized traits like empathy and the ability to win friends and influence people yeah the ability so the ability to emotionally <laughs> manipulate people but also the ability to empathize with your employees to kind of uh, create a nurturing atmosphere where they can pursue their their calling. I mean, so those kind of feminized traits are now also totally incorporated into this also macho language of, you know, being a decisive leader in your, in the office. Because there's this whole other side. We've been talking about this whole celebration of pliability and flexibility of people and entities that adapt to their circumstances as they are. But, mm -hmm. but then there's this seemingly contrary celebration of people who make circumstances. 
the sort of Ran- mm-hmm. Anne Randian sort of hero and, and mm-hmm. force others to do the adapting. And maybe this is drawing on this more old fashioned hagiography of capitalists as heroic masculine leaders, the the rebellious disruptor who, as Mark yeah. Zuckerberg put it, moves fast and breaks things. Um, you know, instead of a capitalist or a businessman or boss, we have this entrepreneur with with a noble vocation. And you write that this that this all goes back to maybe just the beginning of capitalism, what what Max Weber identified as profit making, which are at face value is kind of gross, requiring a justification in the religious language of a calling. Explain that and how this valorization of more masculine attributes, how that coexists and melds with the celebration of, of feminized attributes like flexibility and, and empathy. Yeah. Um, so Weber's basic point in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism is to identify how it could be that making a profit, getting rich, could be defended as virtuous as it routinely was. And he's looking at one of his major sources is Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, in which uh, Ben Franklin, in a, in a way that's extremely familiar to us now, suggests that he is so successful because he is so virtuous, because, that his success is a mark of his discipline, of his r- rigid and rigorous commitment to, to his work. And so, so getting rich is not just, you know, some vain or venal desire to be more powerful than the next person or to pursue status or to chase, you know, filthy lucre, but it's, it's a way in which you uh, live out your vocation, you know, your devotion to an idea of a, being a good person. Which is itself rooted in the, the Protestant, maybe specifically Calvinist, idea of predestination and, and how people inhabit such a kind of brutal theology. Yeah, if, you are, if, if you're saved, if you're the elect, you'll show it by how good you are. And so everyone endeavors to be good because they are hoping that that shows that they're the elect. And so, so there's nothing, you know, in that respect new about the way that uh, contemporary business discourse is so moralistic, you know, celebrating the visionary innovator, identifying someone's success as a consequence of their, just their passion or their entrepreneurial zeal. That's like an old, that's an old story, especially in the United States. What's I think peculiar about business discourse now is that it's not for what it was for Weber in which the kind of spiritual idea of a calling or a vocation is appropriated by or incorporated into market relations. Now the way that we talk about innovation, about the zeal to be an entrepreneur about how entrepreneurship is some, is something that is inherent in children and needs only to be nurtured for your child to become successful. That we now talk about these kind of spiritual aspects of the economy as basically human nature, as basically the source of profit, rather than as something that has to be uh, you know, appropriated in order to justify the will to, to become rich or to become profitable. So like the way in which entrepreneurship has it has become treated as this kind of basic inherent human desire or human trait. This this ideology is spoken most clearly perhaps by thought leaders. These organic intellectuals of the ruling class, someone that you cite calls them that, um who who dispense mm-hmm. wisdom at Davos or by way of TED Talks, what function do thought leaders serve? One one thing they seem to do for me is emphasize thoughts and ideas 
so as to obscure raw material power, something that might also explain the pervasiveness of, of metaphor in a lot of these keywords. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the importance of metaphor really, I think, indicates both the, the, the kind of tautological self-confirming style of argument that uh, that you encounter a lot in like the business press in which there's not really any sign that people have considered like a critique or really thought very hard about an outside perspective on on business so there's this you know so you're never you're never outside you're always kind of endlessly circling this drain and the thought leader also just like the entrepreneur ideal and the innovator ideal celebrates this kind of individualistic hero who conquers through their ideas and not through either their their labor or through their manipulation of other people's labor or through primitive accumulation right um so so you know again the 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 point is what maybe the point of capitalist ideology has always been which is to obscure the exploitation of labor um and that's so that's the old that's the old story um the somewhat new story i guess is the way that the idea of the thought leader kind of manipulates the idea of the democratic idea of leadership uh, by which i mean the ideal of leadership that you see in sort of self-help books in which anybody can be a leader doesn't matter if you actually paid like one you can still be one but there can only be one thought leader, or there can only be very few. So thought leadership is a is an is one of the the rare examples in the kind of like culture of of contemporary business that actually will acknowledge hierarchy as as a, as a thing that exists and as a thing that should exist, because there's this kind of you know this this sort of vacuous and often touchy feely uh, psychological aesthetic in a kind of egalitarian sheen to a lot of the language that I'm talking about. Um, but again, with thought leader, there's a, there's a religious lineage because I don't know if you know who the original thought leader was, Dan. No. Oh, Christ. <laughs> yeah. No less than, no less than Jesus Christ himself. <laughs> so, so it has these kinds of, it has the, that kind of prophetic, uh, prophetic air that 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 innovation does, and there's something evangelical about it. I think the way that thought leadership is invested with this kind of power to uh, spread, as it were, a gospel of of business thinking to whoever hears it. And it's just and you know and thought leadership is so. Or the the idea of a of a thought leader, you know, is not one that kind of possesses a particular kind of critical intelligence. So it's not a, a thought leader is never skeptical, you know, a thought leader is never, never doubtful. In fact, they have an, they have an idea for how one innovation can end cholera or something. Right. Just one simple trick. <laughs> Cause they tend to peddle techno fixes. Yeah. I mean, to, so to be a thought leader also, I mean, you have to have a kind of like, well, you have to have a brand, so you have to have a, a thing that you say and you repeat and that is digestible and easily intelligible. So like a person like Thomas Friedman is a good example. You know, he's so great at, I have to sometimes admit to grudgingly admiring this, the way that he can, he's always trying to coin some kind of cute catchphrase or, or glib name for something, you know, like the earth is flat or whatever. So yeah, those kind of thought leadership is the is the generation of those kinds of glib phrases that appear to boil down some wisdom into a nugget that you can, you know, digest and then excrete <laughs> as compost. <laughs> In line with this this idealist emphasis, another key word there is conversation. Perhaps most memorably for those of us who remember the 1990s well, in Bill Clinton's con national conversation about race. There's also engagement, 
which is in significant part pretty explicitly, at least in the example you cite, a, a tool to deactivate opposition by superficially incorporating the civilian objects of policy and planning as stakeholders, to return to that keyword. Yeah. And all of these keywords suggest that there's some real open-ended and egalitarian exchange of ideas. And again, like so many other things we've been discussing in doing so, that erases or invisibilizes the raw materiality of power. Yeah. So the the like maybe like every word in the book, the the point is to deny power where it exists and where you do acknowledge it to um, diffuse it so vaguely that it can't be uh, identified or named. You know. So engagement like in the idea of political engagement, um, identif it seems at least aware or it is, you know, engaging with the idea of political policy, political. So therefore, you know, interest groups who have more or less power than others. But, uh, so when you talk about civic engagement, you're talking about like bringing people, bringing like regular citizens who are affected by some policy change into the, process of crafting a particular law to address it. So the example I talk about comes from Detroit, where I lived and worked f for several years, where city planners were, you know, developing a new master plan for the city and um, developed this uh, process of public hearings and public feedback mechanisms by which people were ostensibly invited to engage in the process. But of course, you know, the, the decisions were ultimately made by the same people you would have expected before. So engagement was, and I think often is, undertaken maybe with great intentions, and it's not necessarily like a sinister lie or deception. But it, the way it gets used is I think it camouflages actual lines of power and, and authority as if they are... Um, permeable and and as if they don't exist in many cases. And so conversation is another great example of that. So th I think I first became a lot of the words that in the book, actually all of them are the result of, you know, me just being an irritated by something, you know, s seeing, seeing a word used and used and, and becoming obs obsessed with it or someone else becoming obsessed with it and then asking me to write about it. So, so conversation, you know, I, I think I encountered it in the relentless invitations from any kind of like media organization to join the conversation, you know, like join the conversation on Twitter at the NPR or join the conversation on our website at foxnews.com or something. Um, and, you know, if you have any kind of uh, basic critical approach to the media, you know, you have to recognize that media organizations or represent particular interests, whether class interests or political interests. And so this idea that I'm like joining a horizontal conversation with the folks at NPR, you know, is kind of a farce, but, but that's what a conversation is. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a chat between two people who are equals. And in the case of the conversation about race, it's related to this really pernicious idea of race relations as this really obfuscatory euphemism for racism. Yeah, so race relations are not a material relationship. They are not a history of exploitation of legal and de facto segregation. They are a kind of set of attitudes, you know, in the when we're talking about race relations. And attitudes can be, I guess, addressed through conversations. You know, you can talk it out. It's like a, a kind of, a, another kind of example of the psychological language that we were just describing earlier with leadership and um, thought leadership and stuff. So you have a conversation about something if you, you have a conversation about something with an equal. But if you're talking about something like the history of racist segregation in the United States, 
history of racism in the United States. Obviously, you're fundamentally not talking about something occurring between equals, because that's the whole. <laughs> that's the whole point is that it's not uh, is that it's inegalitarian. It's a system of domination. Yeah, um, and so reducing it to a conversation. I mean, it really is reducing it to a conversation is a way of neutralizing it and of kind of defanging any possible opposition and, and just talking about it not as a system of power, but as a set of bad attitudes. And the, I mean the other, and then, so the national conversation on race is, which is a sort of spectacle that Bill Clinton convened proceeded under the, I think the idea that quote unquote race relations could be addressed through people being honest and talking about their feelings. So when he had these kind of town, they were kind of like town hall meetings, people in, were invited to like be frank, to speak frankly about their attitudes about whiteness or blackness or racism or... Funny, that's what Trump asked people to do in 2016 too. <laughs> yeah, and so the idea was that like by talking it out, we would come to a understanding kind of like you might do in your therapist's office or something. And then the, the the idea, I think, got new life with the Obama presidency. The beer summit. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that's a great example of the farce of the of a conversation about something so consequential. So my, you know, my feeling about that is that you, you have a conversation about something fun and trivial most of the time. Uh, if you're talking about something serious and potentially painful, potentially disruptive, transformative, whatever, you're generally, you're generally not having a conversation. You might be having a fight, a conflict. <laughs> yeah, a rebellion or something. Or at its most specific, at least a negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Because that at least acknowledges that there's two sides and or that there are multiple sides and that there are power dynamics. Um, so... To me, the 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 popularity of the uh, the the concept of the conversation on race is is a sign of how unseriously the subject of racism is taken by the people who use that phrase. I think because if if you if you thought it was serious, it would be worth more than a conversation. One thing that really stood out to me in your book is how influential such a small number of sources have been in coining and mainstreaming these keywords most notably yeah. on the one hand joseph schumpeter and on the other hand the harvard business review from schumpeter who was writing in the first half of the 20th century we get creative destruction entrepreneur innovation from a 1990 article in harvard business review we get competencies a 1993 article popularizes the idea of the business ecosystem. Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen has a 1997 book entitled The Innovator's Dilemma, which coins the term disruptive innovation. Um, this is a different publication, but same argument. A 1997 Fast Company article invented the notion of a personal brand. Mm -hmm. What's your take on on how the business press on the one hand and Joseph Schumpeter seemingly on the other hand have have played such decisive roles in building this language. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, I think, and Schumpeter, by the way, also was a Harvard professor. So maybe the the, the common thread here is uh, Harvard. And so um, if we simply get rid of Harvard, we'll, we'll be all right, I guess, is the lesson here. Abolishing Harvard <laughs> will abolish capitalism. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, um, it's a consequence of that, of just the, the dominance of, of Harvard and Ivy League in general in terms of American intellectual life. But also uh, it's a consequence of what I've noticed in my reading of the business press, which is just a kind of tendency to repeat and recapitulate older ideas, but also to search for kind of new ways of naming older things. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, 
it's an it's a it, the business pre, the business publication economy is an economy of course that values innovation and what that means in practice as it means in a, every other sphere of life is that it values performing the elaborate pantomime of doing something new uh, but simply splashing a new paint job on an old veneer i think is 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 kind of how that kind of how it works many of the keywords are part of an ideology that calls upon us to optimize ourselves as individuals to survive and then thrive amidst these naturalized market conditions and that thus implicitly blames us as individuals if we fail or something bad happens to us or so as to hack our lives rather the rather than transform the system that shapes them we have to invest in our human capital we have to develop not only skills but competencies we have to have passion and do what we love and love what we do and maximize our wellness to to what extent does this language create and discipline ideal late capitalist subjects and to what degree does it does it fail to do so and more serve as legitimating ad copy for the system or does it do both well again the it, it it's always dialectical so the safe answer and the correct answer <laughs> is that it does both i mean it's it depends on the case but you know to just take the example of wellness wellness is a is a word that like a few of the others has a kind of countercultural origin i mean it comes out of a certain kind of new agey critique of the of the health care industry and of the pharmaceutical industry and of medical establishment i guess and so it 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 starts life as a as a way of investing people with a sense of control over their own health so you were not simply responding to sickness or to a doctor's diagnosis of sickness but you were pursuing wellness um as it's been taken up by human resources departments in firms that offer some version of health insurance to their employees, it's a way of making you responsible for your health care rather than like an insurance company or better yet, a, a national health service be responsible for your health care. So it's about, again, like, like as with others that we've talked about, it's a way of off outsourcing risk, in this case, the risk of employing somebody who's human and therefore might get sick to you, the human who might get sick. Now it's your fault. If you get sick, it's because you smoke too much or you ate too many Doritos or you didn't exercise enough or whatever. And then it valorizes the the affluent person's fit body in the same way that the lean, nimble corporation is is, is valorized. Yeah, right, right. In contrast to you know what. <laughs> yeah, so... But then the other part of your question about uh, was about ways in which these the popularity of these words kind of invite opposition. Is that right? Or if these are trying to create neoliberal subjects, does it work? I mean, you know, uh, the I guess the point of creating a subject is that it's a aspiration. It's always an aspiration. I mean, it's never a. We would live in a purely dystopian hell world if it if it worked like completely or if it worked and then the process is over, it's always a, a process of subject making is something that is constantly renewing itself and being interrupted. So sometimes it works, of course, sometimes it becomes he- these, these kind of ideas become hegemonic. They become dominant like wellness. Um, but of course, wellness thinking isn't preventing people from demanding national health care, you know, in the United States, for example. So, you know, it's, it has worked and it hasn't, or it, or it isn't. And plenty of the words I've talked about in the book have become, you know, like synergy or disruption have become either cliches or in the case of disruption, I think people, many people identify that word more often with like Martin Shkreli and kind of the cruelties of the corporate elite or with that company. One of the ones I talk about in the book, that company, I don't know if you remember Bodega, (laughs) which, which was, uh, 
kind of a vending machine 2.0 that was going to disrupt stores, you know, and then that failed and everyone made fun of it. Um, so, you know, like the, I think a lot of the, the, the kind of culture that I'm talking about is coming under increasing strain and what these keywords do sometimes is to, you know, try to fashion neoliberal subjects who identify their interests with their bosses and identify their freedom with with their work and uh, identify themselves with their work and with and with and freedom with consumer choice as well. Yeah, right. But they're always responding, I think, to real grievances and real fears and real anxieties. So the need to uh, promote the what was the example you gave the the innovative solution to cholera or something like the yeah the app that will end cholera or whatever <laughs> um, or the you know the 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 solar powered toilet that will remove the need to provide rural Africans with plumbing or something you know you don't because you don't need to worry about that now we've developed this toilet at Caltech or something that will that will address these kind of profound social problems. Obviously, that the need to develop these kinds of exculpatory storylines comes out of a real sense of fear and crisis, and I think that's that's an important point about all this vocabulary. Like one of the things that it's they all seem to share: innovation, entrepreneurship, creativity, nimble. They're all like relentlessly cheery, you know, cheerful. That's one of the things that's so annoying about them <laughs> is just how uh, glib and uh, upbeat this language is. Uh, and, you know, when you, when you read as much as I have, like Fast Company and Entrepreneur.com and... God bless you. Uh, Forbes.com, <laughs> it, uh, you know, it's, it's, you have to kind of approach it as I do in order to stay sane with a kind of uh, sense of humor. But... You know, it's just it's relentless the how upbeat everybody is. It makes you want to strangle them, you know. Who thinks like I couldn't get enough of Steve Forbes, the individual, I need to read a magazine named after him? <laughs> yeah, well, I I mean I uh I don't know if people remember Steve anymore though. I think the Forbes it's become disembodied. He won a few primaries in the nineties. Like it was 96. Yeah, he was the flat uh, tax guy, right? That was his thing. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. So, yeah, there is this kind of apocalyptic anxiety, almost apocalyptic anxiety behind a lot of the words that we're talking about. Because the reason why innovation is necessary, the reason why we need to talk about it so endlessly, the reason why you need to send your kid, your kindergartner, to entrepreneurship kindergarten, and that's a thing, that's a real thing. There's one in Las Vegas is that the the problems besetting the globe, and the reason why you need to innovate climate change is because there's this looming catastrophe of climate change. The reason you need to send your kid to entrepreneurship summer camp or kindergarten is because you're terrified that they'll never be able to earn a living when they're 20. So there's this kind of real fear that's behind a lot of the words that I think mitigates somewhat the machine of neoliberal subject making that that you were alluding to i mean because these are all kind of trying to nullify something that can't quite be nullified one of the last things i w want to talk about is how a lot of these keywords blur the distinction between public and private most nefariously when it comes to education you cite a bunch of different examples the, the kip charter school network promises to instill grit in poor children of color in other words, hardening yeah. them, making them resilient to the world that they must face, but implicitly at least cannot change. Entrepreneurship education, which you've mentioned already, tries to turn yeah. child's play into job training while also making child's play a model for, for everyone else's life. And, and then, I think most powerfully, accountability. Mm -hmm. Accountability which reduces children's education to data determined outcomes and then uses that as a pretext to impose this high stakes standardized testing regime attack public schools and teachers 
and to privatize it all. It, it, explain how this works in public education and why it is education that above all else has been s- so subjected to, to these fads and logics. Yeah, I mean, it's really a, um, a laboratory for uh, any kind of passing fad or any kind of uh, ideological uh, fixation like someone like Betsy DeVos might have the ability to remake Detroit public schools, for example, in, in the image of her fantasies about what education is. So, I mean, it comes out of this sense of uh, crisis, which I think is is generated around education and public education in the United States in particular, since really the Reagan era, this production of a narrative of schools that are failing. A nation in crisis, is that what that was called? Uh, yeah, right, a nation in crisis. And people... I think that's become almost second nature. I mean, people just often assume, I think as a point of departure, that American public schools are failing. And of course, I'm not saying that there aren't severe problems in American public schooling, but... But the problems are segregation and inequality between segregated schools. Yeah, when you... Right. I mean, yeah, exactly, because plenty plenty of schools are doing quite well. So when you begin with the point of departure that schools are failing then it justifies kind of radical measures to address the the situation and you know people the the that reagan report oh sorry a nation at risk a nation at risk yeah i was surprised to learn when i actually read it that a big part of the argument is just about the um, influence of uh, multiculturalism and post civil rights era reforms in public education as like dumbing down the education system and introducing sociological fads as opposed to rigorous time-tested wisdom, you know? So there's, I mean, it's like an extremely conservative and kind of racist argument at the heart of that report, which I think gets overlooked when uh, we talk about failing schools. So the other thing is that, yeah, I, you know, I think education is always uh, made in the image of the ideal worker of any particular time. So the ideal knowledge, the ideal worker of our time is this kind of knowledge worker, entrepreneur, kind of endlessly flexible person who expects nothing from their government or their employer and has to kind of constantly be on the hustle, constantly be, uh, as you said, gritty and resilient in the face of a world that is kind of uh, inhospitable. So that's kind of the ideal that I think uh, children are often being prepared for. And in that respect, you know, the ideal changes, but the kind of the production of a, of a, of an ideal worker through, um, through schooling is, is, is fairly consistent. I think. Well, one thing that you note about the way this plays out in public education is this emphasis on, on excellence. All schools yeah. are supposed to be excellent, even though that is literally impossible for all schools to be above average. <laughs> and yeah. along similar lines, you cite Penn psychologist and KIPP consultant Angela Duckworth's book, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. Required a lot of perseverance to read that book, by the way. Oh, my God. I can't imagine. <laughs> so I guess I learned, I learned something. <laughs> <laughs> You've read so much garbage for this book. <laughs> Like thousands of pages of garbage for your slim 170 or some 80 page book. (laughs) You write, quote, at one point, she observes that grit can help people defy the odds, a common enough vernacular turn of phrase for overcoming obstacles. Nevertheless, it's a surprising one for a social scientist to use since defying the odds is, by definition, improbable. Explain how what's going on here, which I think is what Lauren Berlant calls cruel optimism, this this demand to to constantly strive for the literally impossible. How does that work? What it, what does the injunction to strive for impossibility do? Well, I mean, it it again doesn't allow you to, and it encourages you not to look for who's doing what to whom, and who's benefiting and who is not. So. Uh, the cruel optimism that Berlin is talking about uh, is the ways in which 
um, the everyday cruelties of life in an unequal society such as ours are fashioned as challenges that you should and can, if you try hard enough and if you are um, determined enough, overcome. And so the the idea of grit, which is an you know is an old ideal of of childhood. It, it uh, it's a it's it's a, one of Horatio Alger's favorite words to talk about the kind of um, behaviors of determination and bravery that young young men need to cultivate. It's a way of saying that there's no social obstacle, no social inequality, no structural obstacle that you can't defeat and overcome through your own agency and your own self-belief. And there's something very appealing about that. You know, it's it's not about saying it's it, it specifically de- denies that poor children in a city public school district are victims of of anything. So it, it suggests that they have the power to do whatever they want to do. But it also suggests that there's no one preventing them from realizing those uh, dreams, which is just a lie. And it's, uh, I don't think it helps anybody to tell them that the obstacles that do exist don't exist simply because it's convenient to believe they don't. What, like when I think about the, the grit thing, I mean, there's this sort of logical impossibility about it that you, that, that you just were discussing, you know, the fact that, you can't defy the odds more than once in a while or once in a rare while by definition. That's what odds are, you know? And there's this, there's this way that the ideal of grit as Duckworth talks about it uh, is just a way of explaining the way things are as being justified or being the way they should be rather than in ma- inviting you to imagine changing the way they are. So like the example that I remember in the book is, you know, if you, if you think about the implications of, of a a child who is encouraged not to be gritty, who is not encouraged to be gritty, you might look at your like 24 year old son or daughter who's unemployed or unhappy or whatever and say, well, I, guess I didn't encourage them to be gritty enough. I guess that's the problem. But, you know, like, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it now? You know, it's a way of explaining the current state of affairs as if it's what it was meant to be. But it doesn't allow you to do anything about it. Um, and so there's something to me quite quite cruel about it because it it doesn't allow you to uh, to correctly say, you know, that you've been screwed when you have been screwed or that certain... that. But it does it under the guise of always offering you this kind of potential and power to transform your circumstances by yourself, of course. You write that demystifying these words might accomplish some political work in robbing them of their seductive power. In the case of neoliberalism, these words reveal the core of what is promised, but neoliberalism fails to deliver. What role do you see language playing then in unmaking this system and building something new in its place? Yeah, I mean, one of the challenges that I faced writing the book and writing the the blog that preceded it was avoiding a kind of miserabilism of claiming that um, the the problems of our our age are are unprecedented, or things are worse than they've ever been, or the twenty first century economy is crueler than than any other. Uh, because I think it's you know it's a it's a feature of neoliberal ideology to to assume that this moment is profoundly transformational. You know it's. It's what every innovator claims about their product, that this is the new thing that's going to change everything. And my friend, uh, Lee Claire LeBerge, who read one of a, an earlier draft of the book, you know, made this kind of uh, revelatory criticism, criticism of it to me because I had kind of, I think, accepted some of these uh, 
accepted some of that logic and I, I you know, I talked about uh, everything as if it was like radically new and unprecedented. And she invited me to, to think about how, in fact, the 21st century language of capitalism, of neoliberalism, is in many ways nothing new at all and just simply a recapitulation or a reframing of older conflicts and struggles. And Ecclesiastes was right. Yeah, it, it was. Ecclesiastes was totally right. And I found it, um, you know, perversely sort of comforting um, and encouraging to think about the ways in which the peculiar and maybe sometimes unique new forms that exploitation and the ideologies that obscure it take are familiar and might have been familiar to our grandparents or our great grandparents that that none of this is anything new because it means that people have been fighting it uh, people have fought sharecropping and then they're fighting the sharing economy you know to put it in those terms so my hope is that the the attention to language kind of encourages people to be vigilant not because you know using the wrong word makes you a bad person or using the right word would change everything but because i think the language that we use shapes uh our political imaginations and also can limit it as for what you know an alternative keywords for the glorious socialist future might look like and maybe even what socialist management theory might look like <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I don't know, i'll leave that to others to, to f come up with that but um you know i uh i know you're a fan of the 18th brumaire marx's 18th brumaire because you had a great show about it and, you know something mark says there where he, he's very attentive you know in that book to political language and to political discourse and one of the things he says is that the po the revolution of the 19th century will take its poetry from the future, not from the past. And so to me, there's a couple things important about that. First of all, that it's, that it should be a poetry and hope. So that's why I'm a little nervous about socialist management theory, <laughs> but also it's a, it's a language that we don't know yet. You know, it's a language we can't speak because it hasn't been made yet. Um, and it'll be made in the process of struggles to undo the much bleaker language that we're forced to speak at work when we're talking about innovative disruptors and entrepreneurial resilience and so forth. Well, John Patrick Leary, thank you very much. Thank you for talking with me. It's been really fun. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after noting that ideas do not exist separately from language. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig is generally produced by Alex Lewis, but this week, while Alex is on a well-deserved vacation, it was produced by Jen Kinney. Music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinator is Julia Rock. Our senior advisor is Thea Riofrancos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio. And please find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. If it's on iTunes or wherever, please also leave us a nice review. Those reviews help introduce us to new listeners. What also does that is you telling friends, family, strangers, anyone about the show. Please make propaganda for us. And do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this thing up and running strong. Even a few bucks a month is huge. Mm -hmm.